Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar on Petra and Beyond, a guide to exploring Jordan. My name is Jonathan Burnham, and I am the marketing director at Wildland Adventures, and I will be your moderator today. And I'm joined by the stars of our show, Sherry Howland, who is our Wildland Middle East director, and one of our top Jordanian guides, Nadir Sali, or NAD. Hello. And he's been a guide in Jordan for the past 10 years. Uh, quick note, we'll be sending a follow-up email after the webinar with a recording of this session. So if you miss anything, don't worry, you'll get a copy of it. Also, we are going to end the session with a Q&A. But for right now, feel free to start asking your questions whenever you have them. There's a question um, box on the left-hand side of your screen. And at the end of the show, we'll start picking questions. So feel free at any time to add questions. <clears throat> so first, uh, quickly about Wildland Adventures. Um, as you can tell from this quote from Outside Magazine that we are all about authenticity. We've been sending travelers around the world for the last 30 years and have been pioneers in the ecotourism industry. And Something we like to do with all of our trips and all of our guests and destinations is really treat them with like the utmost respect. So when we have really good travelers that we send around the world and we, to guides like Nad, who are just top level, excellent guides, and it makes the whole experience uh, for the traveler and for the guide really powerful when they're both on the same page and looking for a lot of the same things within travel. <clears throat> So this is me. Um, throughout the show, I'll be sharing a little bit about my experience hiking along the Jordan Trail. And yeah, that's me racing a donkey. And if you stay tuned to the end, you're going to see who wins that race. <clears throat> so what brings travelers to Jordan? Um, Petra, for sure, is at the top of everyone's mind. It's considered one of the seven wonders of the world. And it's made popular by imagination with films like Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, Queen of the Desert, The Mummy Returns. All of these uh, movies have just made this an iconic symbol. And it's definitely one of the first things everyone thinks about. <clears throat> but to give you a little bit more food for thought, let's talk to Sherry and Nadar. All right. Thanks, JB. Jonathan. Uh, yes, there's so much more to see and do in Petra, and today we're going to be talking about the main sites. If you look at your map here, um, upper center Amman is where most people are going to arrive into Jordan, unless they cross one of the mortars. Uh, but up north is the city of Jarash, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, to the central desert, the Donna Biosphere Reserve. South of that, Petra. And then further south on the borders, Wadi Rum, Aqaba, and then to the west on the border with Israel, the Dead Sea. My very first glimpse of Petra, um, this was back, gosh, in the early 2000s, was actually in the dark by firelight. The magical Petra by night experience with hundreds of votive candles spread on the desert floor, illuminating the face of the treasury. The music of the Bedouins, the strong hot tea to warm you up because it's chilly in the desert at night. Uh, the Bedouin stories and poetry, all of it was just otherworldly. I had no idea then that night just how enormous Petra actually is until the next day when I went back for the full tour. Nada, how do you, as a guide, prepare guests for their first experience of Petra? Hello, Sherry. Thank you very much for that intro. Um, I, preparing anyone for Petra is quite a, an, an adventure in itself, and I mystify them more than anything, to be honest. But I'd like to highlight that Petra is a unique city in, in so many aspects. Uh, first of all, this people that built it didn't really build any city elsewhere in the world, but more so rather than your typical city um, based on resources, availability, uh, based on uh, certain, certain things like water and food and, and maybe climate, Petra was chosen on the merits of its geographical location, on the merits that it was in the middle of an inland trade hub at the time, and they had to make for 
the lack of resources in ingenious ways, ways that are really, really humbling and just remarkable. And that's what I like to share with people. They managed to turn this desolate place into what we think was a cosmopolitan city of the classical world. It's quite something. Nice. <clears throat> and what about the monastery? Um, well, now, yes, we're looking at the monastery. This is the first thing we see coming into Petra from the back, roughly speaking, four or five miles in from the entry gate proper, but we're coming in from the back, so we have that advantage. And that means that we're there before everyone else. Um, this building was later used as a monastery. And that's where the name comes in. There was a monastic tradition upheld in this sacred place. It's on the mountaintops of Petra. Uh, but originally, we think this related to um, one of their big famous kings. It was a mausoleum. It was a, it was a tomb. And that's an overarching theme in Petra. It's also a confusing theme because when they first excavated the site, most of what was there to see were tombs. And we'll be getting into a lot more detail there. Nice. For example, the, another good site in Petra being the Great Temple of Petra. Absolutely, absolutely. This is one of the things that was a real eye-opener when it was first uh, excavated. Um, only 10%, get this folks, 10% of the site of Petra is excavated. This is of that 10%. And that's even still a hot debate, this site. Uh, one group of people thinks it's a temple, that's the name. Another thinks it's an administrative building. I'll be sharing with you the two theories, two hypotheses, and I'll let you decide. We have come to the conclusion that even though Petra is so well known, Jordan is so much more than just Petra. Um, we want to take this opportunity that we have with all of you. What about the tombs, Nad, of the southern part of the city? What we're looking at now, and I'll get back to Sherry's point, and I think that's a very valid point. I do hope to share with you a lot more than Petra. But yeah. um, what you're seeing right now are collectively called the royal tombs, and they're literally dominating downtown Petra. They're literally overlooking the cargo the commercial street of the city. And this was a very confusing point early on in exploring Petra because unlike their counterparts, the tombs were literally in key prominent positions in the city as opposed to being isolated and being um, uh, having a dedicated place outside of the city parameters. But these are literally dominating the city view. They have some of the prime locations in the whole city. And exploring them is quite something, which is something we will be doing. Yeah, it's it's really amazing to essentially go to Petra thinking, you know, you've seen the monastery and you've seen the treasury in uh, magazines and everything. And then you see something like the tombs of the southern part of the city and you're like, wow, it's a whole, it's a real whole city at a grand scale. Um, and moving on, something really unique that, that I know that we do for our travelers is creating a really unique view of seeing um, the treasury. And that goes with a uh, hiking to the top of it. Absolutely. That is a unique uh, viewpoint. It's quite a beautiful hike. It offers, offers you views of the city as you go approach. And then ultimately you'll be overlooking the treasury proper. It's quite a spectacular sight. Yeah, so you can see right here, it looks like just you know a big pile of rocks. If you look a little closer, you can see these little tiny huts that are built up on the rock. And it looks a little it looks a little daunting, but you get photos and opportunities to see the treasury like no one else does. And it's yeah, it's breathtaking. It's certainly it's certainly a, it's certainly an option. It's certainly an option. I mean the Petra is full of options. This is one of them, absolutely. And, and another option at Petra is Petra by night as well. Uh, weather permitting, I, I have to stress that because it is a candlelit show. I mean, obviously, if it's too windy, if it's uh, if it's uh, wet in any way, it's going to be a problem. But yes, it is a quite a sight, a candlelit show on Petra. Great, but moving on, there's definitely a lot more to see and do in Jordan. Oh, here we are. This is my favorite. Can I take over, Jonathan? You go for it. Go for it. <laughs> 
Jaras Fox is my hometown. I was born there. I'm still living there with a family. I've got a boy and three girls at the moment. And this, I kid you not, used to be my childhood playground, and I'm serious about it. We used to play hide and seek there. We used to draw a map of the city and say where we were hiding. It was quite the, quite the sight. It's changed so much since my childhood. I mean, excavations there are ongoing. As, it, as you can see, it's one of the most beautiful, most the best preserved Roman sites out there. We actually claim it isn't well on top. Um, although it's not one of the biggest Roman cities out there, it is definitely one of the best preserved. You hopefully finish your tour of Jarash with a real feel of what a Roman city is. You relate the streets, the markets, to the temples, to you relate the city components to each other. And I'm certainly going to share with you some secret hideaway places I know, certainly. And nearby is the Ajlan Castle, yes? This, this is the counter-crusader castle of the 12th century, yes. And it was built to counter the expansion of the Crusades after they established their, uh, they called the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. They built, built a number of, of, of forts, making this parameter. And this was on the buffer area to counter that Crusader expansion. It's roughly speaking, is sort of a nod between Damascus and big city. It's quite the place, very explorable, very interesting. It has an elaborate water system and the characteristic features you expect in Crusader Castles. And I say Crusader Castles because they actually built their technology based on Crusader Castles. Great. Great. Easily one of my favorite Jordan highlights is Wadi Rum. Um, anyone out there who has seen the classic 1962 film, Lawrence of Arabia, has seen this magnificent landscape of Wadi Rum. The deep red dunes, the soaring mountains, some reaching heights of 6,000 plus feet. But Wadi Rum also has human history dating to the fourth century BC. Nads, what can you tell us about Wadi Rum? What about the experience of camping there, the Bedouin people who still live there? Nice, nice, nice. There's a lot uh, to be said about Wadi Rum. I mean, the name itself is quite an interesting name. It translates to the Valley of Heights, if you will. The Valley of Heights. If you look at that picture right in front of you, you stand at the desert floor, you look up, and these cliffs rise for hundreds of meters. I mean, a couple of thousand feet vertical sometimes right in front of you. So it gives us uh, this feeling of height. It's quite uh, humbling. It's quite a, it's quite a place uh, that really connects you with, with, with the grandness and the grandeur of nature, full of full of human remains. What you're seeing right now, for example, are what we call rock inscription. I like to call ancient graffiti, which we literally take to be the case. Um, Bedouins passing by as they did in that area for, for millennia and drawing their favorite animal, you know, maybe writing their name as well. From the evidence we have there, yeah, comfortably, we're talking about uh, existence, human existence, going back to Neolithic times, going back to the classical period. The Nabataeans had a trade post, for example, over there. Um, and, and more recently, this was a major arena for World War I events. And, and, and for example, famous you know, characters like Lawrence of Arabia really loved the place. And staged one of the biggest attacks along with the Arabic Revolution from that position. You're seeing um, a characteristic the communal tent in Wadi Rum. The walls, the lining of the walls, that's the authentic Bedouin goat hair and sheep wool tent. Of course, now it's, it's, it's supported. The structure is supported a little bit more to make it more practical, but the material is the authentic material used there for ages. And the setting, people are sitting on the ground as such. This is also the traditional oriental seating where you can sit there and have a meal and have a drink uh, and enjoy the views this is this is what you expect the tents to be like in Wadi Rum, at least the communal ones and, and speaking of views oh natural bridges yes <laughs> that's quite uh, that's quite tempting that one they say that the average lifetime for a natural bridge is 10,000 years. I'm not sure how long that one's been there, to, to be honest. But climbing it is quite nice. It, it, you do need to challenge yourself sometimes, definitely. And these are found throughout Petra, throughout Wadi Rum. Uh, the sandstone formation of Wadi Rum, folks, is actually a continuation of the sandstone formation of Petra itself. So you've got these odd 
uh, looking voodoos, they call, they call them hoodoos, sorry, and natural rock bridges and all kinds of odd formations. And of course, the locals have all kinds of weird and funny names for them. It's always funny to, to listen to them name their formations. Yeah, and there's also some little extensions and side activities you can do in Wadi Rum, like hot air ballooning. It's definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful. But the people here are really, really um, sensitive when it comes to any any winds. They're really, really careful. So although you can try, but if there's a hint of wind, um, they won't go through with the hot air ballooning. But it's definitely worth it. I mean, if the weather suits you well, the climate cooperates, weather cooperates, definitely go for it. Absolutely. Yeah, amazing views from up there. <clears throat> and also things like... Um, Yoga, if you want to be able to have a yoga session while you're at while you're on. Mm-hmm. Okay, almost every trip to Jordan ends in one of two places, the Dead Sea or Aqaba. At the Dead Sea, you can bob like a cork in the hypersaline waters, slap <laughs> on the curative mud as our model, Jonathan, is demonstrating here. Jonathan, tell us. Was your skin just glowing after this? Yeah, I got compliments for days, Sherry. Uh-huh. Just how just glowing I looked after this. But this is definitely a really fun, I mean, you'll see if you go to Instagram or, or Google Dead Sea, you're for sure going to see photos of everyone covered in the clay. And it's definitely a fun experience. I just finished hiking along the Jordan Trail for five days, got to my hotel, ran down to the beach, just covered myself in all this and jumped in the water and as therapeutic and um, beneficial as a lot of the minerals and water have is also just a really fun experience. And when people talk about how salty the dead sea is and how much you float, it's unimaginable how much you actually float. Like it feels like you have a life jacket on. Like if you try and I did just swim down, you, you can't like, it's just so almost like a, Almost feels like it's thick because of how buoyant it is. Yeah, it's a really fun. Um, and then you get the side perk that you, uh, some funny photos and your skin feels nice. <laughs> <laughs> and the other spot, Aqaba, on um, the Gulf by yeah. the name, offers great scuba outings, clubs, resorts. How often do you lead people to Aqaba, Ned? Is that a um, uh, place? I, I do go there, uh, not very often, but every now and then, especially on a long trip, it might be a bit tiring. People enjoy spending a day or two winding off by the beach. It's generally warm all year round, so that's a great advantage. If it's a cold day, you definitely count on Aqaba to be quite warm. And, you know, you can just lay by the beach. You can go for any water sports. Practically the whole array is available there. So it's a really nice uh, resort dash um, city. I mean, the city there is an ancient city, and there's also some archaeology there. You can visit the old Ottoman forts. You can visit the old Islamic port city. Um, it's quite interesting. So there's plenty of stuff there, but generally speaking, people like to go there to relax and practice some real, real snorkeling and scuba diving. Awesome. That image is a really nice one. Yes, it is. Well, I hope this quick overview of the Kingdom of Jordan has been helpful to you all. Wildland Adventures with our Jordanian colleagues and guides like Matt offer two ways of experiencing the country. Our Jordan Explorer is a private 11-day exploration that touches on most of what we've just covered here uh, today. But our newest itinerary, Dana de Petra, is Trekking the Jordan Trail, a 12-day adventure. For those of you out there wanting a real backcountry experience of the desert, Hiking anywhere from 8 to 12 miles each day, sleeping in comfortable tents under, under the desert stars each night. I did this trek back in 2012. JB did it just in May. In May. And Nat, I would have to think that you've done it quite a few times. I've done it a few times, yes. yes. I'm afraid I did stop counting, but it, I've done it quite a few times. Yeah, and this portion of this trip, it's just five days of trekking, and then it combines a few other highlights along the way, like water, Amman City Tour and Wadi Rum at the end of the trip. So there's definitely and not, the in the Dead Sea, there's definitely not just 12 days of trekking, but the five days of trekking that you have definitely covers a fair amount of ground. And it's it can be a challenging hike, but it's super rewarding. One of 
for hiking in the desert, you'd think sometimes that it's just a desert landscape, but you start your trek in uh, Dana, the Dana bio, uh, Biosphere Reserve, and that right there goes through four biospheres just to start the trek. So you really think you're going through just the desert, but you end up seeing so many beautiful landscapes along the way. I mean, this is just also to show kind of the grand scale of everything you around you is just magnificent and you get to walk by little tiny um shepherd huts and there's caves and ancient dwellings all around you throughout the entire hike <clears throat> and you also get to meet like really cool interesting people so this was kind of um this is our friend Mahmood, and he essentially just was um our donkey uh, trainer. So he came with the donkey to help carry some of the, the equipment along the way. But it was a really awesome experience that we were more similar in age. And you just got to really be able to experience his life. Like he's a better, you know, he, 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 he has a way different lifestyle. So be able to share these cross cultural experiences was, was really powerful. <clears throat> One of my favorite aspects when I did this trek was sites like this, a woman leading her herd of goats out in the desert and the tents will be set up and I felt it was almost surreal it's like you're really stepping back into a life that is so ancient but still continuing on today and one of my favorite things about this trip is taking the back door to Petra so everyone else enters through the normal way right up in front and they're just instantly in the mix of the crowds of people but taking the back door to petra is this, this entire trek we saw no one else besides just uh some bedouin sheep herders it was it's amazing experience to be pretty much out there and so to be able to go into uh the back door of petra you first get to see uh the monastery just completely to yourself by arriving there early in the morning and, and i don't know if you have a um, some examples of that, uh, Nad, about that kind of experience. Absolutely. I mean, usually we camp right outside the back entrance, and we do start as early as possible. And we're there literally with sometimes no one or sometimes a few people, but it's quite a, a special experience for everyone. I mean, I find that a lot of the hikers find it to be the, the, the you know, the cherry on top of the, the, the cake, the, 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 the culmination of the trip, really. So it is yeah. definitely rewarding. And you also get a way more rewarding experience because you've done the five days of trekking. You, you didn't just take, I mean, not that there's any problem with just showing up in a van, but you really feel like you got the full experience of Petra by taking those Bedouin trails and, and you're really entering the city uh, like people have done for centuries. Very um, true. Very true. Yeah. Can I add something there? Um, yeah. As, cool. you, as, you, as you approach Petra from the back or, or you know, as you hike in towards Petra, you do pass by some features that belong to the to the city. Like you literally are passing some of the suburbs, some of the agricultural villages, some of the trade posts. Like we will be visiting something called Little Petra. And it's a really nice build-up to the city proper. They get to you get introduced to the city slowly as you get closer and closer. It's really fascinating. I, I really do enjoy it and, and and guests sharing this Dana to Petra hike really find it fun and enjoyable and a really good way to experience Petra. Yeah, and then also along with this trip, being able to go explore uh, sites like Wadi Rum. Definitely beautiful, yep. Yeah. And then another great thing about this trip is some of the accommodations. So, for example, right here is Fainan Eco Lodge, which is in the Dana uh, Biosphere Reserve. And this is one of the top eco lodges in the world. Uh, rated, I don't know if it's well, Nat Geo. Or, yeah, Nat Geo. Yeah, this, it. this is Google Fainon, and you'll you'll find some pretty amazing um, reviews and awards for this. Um, and one of the amazing things about this is you can see the stars come out like none other when you're out there in the desert. And on top of the lodge, they have beds for stargazing. And yeah, it's just breathtaking to be able to sit up there with zero light around you and just stargaze. If I can add something, I remember waking up before dawn at Benon, and I climbed up to the roof, and the breeze was so refreshing, and the stars were just starting to kind of glint out as the sun came up. And then this maybe nine-year-old child 
took out his herd of sheep. And the rattling of their bells into the desert, it was just magical. Again, it was like time had not changed. And as well, along with some of the eco lodges and other accommodations, are the wilderness camps along the trail. And these are this is this is pretty close to a glamping experience in the sense that you show up after a day of hiking, all of the tents are set up, and the staff that we work with here, it's amazing that you are literally in the middle of nowhere and they make incredible meals for you. So to be show up after a long day of hiking, have everything set up and a beautiful meal ready for you, and then you get to have some tea and watch the stars come out is, yeah, it, it is camping done right for sure. <clears throat> so yes, to wrap everything up. <laughs> Bravo. Definitely. Sadly, Farhan the donkey did not uh, couldn't couldn't manage to uh, to beat me in the race. And the word on the street was that he was the fastest donkey in Jordan. So maybe next time I'll give him um, a rematch. But here's the time, though. If you have questions, uh, please start entering them in the question box, which is right there in the left hand corner. I know we have a few questions already. Um, Nadir. Can you only get to Petra by hiking? Is it easy to get uh, there with kids or less able travelers? Um, yeah, absolutely. It is easy to get in there um, with, with, with ramps available, with, with vehicles of all sorts, from golf carts to horse driven carriages to simple pathways. So you can, yeah, yeah, make it in there in any way you, you see fit or you see necessary. So it's definitely an accessible site, definitely. Nice. And uh, we have a question here from another one. Can you accommodate different types of trips? For instance, the trekking slash hiking trip sounds amazing, but I would rather do three days than five. Is that an option? Yes. Can I, can I answer that one? Yeah, of course. Ah, okay, so, so absolutely. Um, what we do sometimes is we pick some of the highlight days of the, the hike based on, on, on our guest experience, and we sort of uh, fit in a few transfers. So we use local trucks, and we go from point to point, and we choose some of the days we want to highlight. Usually, certainly we do the first day as a hike, and we do the last day, and we choose one of the highlight days in the middle. And that's using pick up four by four pickup trucks for transfers. So it's, it's, it's quite entertaining as well. It's quite interesting in itself. So definitely the option is there. You can cut it down to three days, literally four days, five, you can even expand it, but I don't think that would be necessarily, um, you know, a, a good plan because we do want to see a lot more of the country. Yes. And when is the best time to visit Jordan and, and specifically hiking the Jordan trail? What I have to say to that is that you definitely want to avoid our hot summer months. I mean, I would definitely choose a winter month over a summer one. Although you do have, there's a good likelihood of you getting some cold and wet weather in the winter. It's still a lot more doable than it is in the summertime. So I would avoid midsummer months. So generally speaking, June, July, August, definitely want to avoid those, quite frankly, I'm being quite frank here, especially when you're doing the Wadi Araba portion of the day, when you're down in the Jordan Valley, it can reach temperatures soaring to, I don't know, 100 and plus Fahrenheit, easy. So I would generally go for our spring and autumn, and if necessary, winter season, for sure. That's awesome. Uh, we have another question that, yes, this will, a recording of this will be sent to you, uh, so... You got that. And there's a question here for Sherry. How easy is it to combine other countries with Jordan? For example, Egypt very, or another destination? Very easy. We are doing more and more combinations of Egypt and Jordan. Just in the past month, month and a half, um, I've been getting a lot of requests for that particular combination. Also, Israel. It's very easy to go across the Allenby Bridge into Israel from the Dead Sea area, Dead Sea, Aqaba, um, in that area. Yeah, that's that's what I did on my trip was after hiking the Jordan Trail, I extended for another week in Egypt, and it was a great combo. And having the kind of two sides and two history together yeah. and see how they blended and merged over, the, over time was, was a great experience in itself. So I think that's it for questions in our time. Um, thank you so much to everyone that joined. You can see Sherry Halligan's contact details 
once again, uh, make sure to check your email that we'll have plenty of um, little tips about Jordan and recording of this scent. Um, so thank you very much for joining and stay tuned for more. And thank you, Nadir. Nadir. Enjoy joining you. Thank you so much, Nadir. And, and I can't stress enough that I hope everyone gets a chance to meet Nadir when they visit Jordan. I'm, because he is one of the top guys for sure. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. And all the best to you folks. Cheers. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you.